welcome to the video. Uh, in this video, we'll talk about the management of adult chronic asthma. So, like in any country, when it comes to management, there are some rules and regulations. There are some authorities that govern these guidelines and um, come up with these guidelines that help practitioners uh, practice medicine in a more standardized way. Similarly, in the UK, we have uh, two of these authorities that do that. One is NICE and the other one is BTS. So NICE stands for National uh, Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which produces guidelines for everything. So if you want to look up anything, uh, management, diagnosis of any kinds of stuff, you go to NICE's website and find guidelines for it over there. But when it comes to pulmonary stuff, there's also the BTA which is the British Thoracic Society and that comes up with its own guidelines. There's some differences between what each one says but overall at the end the aim for it, uh, their aim is for patient betterment and to improve people's health and treat them in the best and most eff efficient way possible. So in this video we'd mostly focus on what the BTS get guidelines say. I'll throw in what the NICE guidelines say from time to time, but for uh, exam purposes, even in the Oxford Clinical Medicine Handbook, they uh, follow the BDS uh, guidelines. So this video would cover that. So right off the bat, the BDS guidelines tell us what the aim of the guidelines are and what the aim of the management and treatment should be. So here are some of the things that we should be aiming for when we treat people with chronic asthma. They should not have any symptoms during the day. Uh, they should not wake up during the night because of symptoms due to asthma. They should not need their rescue medicine. Uh, they should not have any asthma attacks. They shouldn't have any limitations for, uh, while they exercise. Their lung functions should be normal, uh, which means that their PEF should be over 80% of the predicted value. And uh, there should be minimal side effects if they are on any medication for asthma. So uh, in order to achieve these, these guidelines are there and we'll go through what medication can be used and when it should be used and what are some of the side effects of each one of those. Before we begin, there are two simple rules that we need to remember in um, management of chronic asthma for adults. Number one is that if the symptoms are not controlled, you need to step up the ladder or add more treatment options. So the treatment for chronic asthma uh, in adults is like uh, stepwise. It's considered, think of it as a ladder. If one thing fails, you add on another, and then you add on a third one, and so on and so forth. So if the symptoms are not controlled, you go up that defined ladder. And the second thing is that uh, if the patient is stable on a certain number of medications for more than three months, then you try to wean them off of those medications. Not all of them, but at least one of them and see how they do. If they are symptom free from, uh, then let's say from, if they were on three medication, you took off one, they're symptom free for uh, three months, you take out another one and see if they're doing okay with them. And so that the, basically the aim of it is to keep minimal number of medications uh, that the patient is using. And the third minor rule is that prednisolone can be used as a rescue at any time. So uh, just as a refresher, we all know if someone has chronic asthma, they have had these symptoms of wheezing, occasional wheezing to begin with. Usually a young uh, patient comes in, complains of wheezing or exercise-induced wheezing and shortness of breath. They, we start them on, the first thing we start them is uh, an inhaler. And what is this inhaler? This is usually a beta-2 agonist, a short-acting uh, bronchodilator. Uh, um, we call them SABA or SABA, uh, which stands for short-acting beta-2 ag uh, 
agonists. So the best example of this is uh, salbutamol. Salbutamol is used when we ask them to use that when, whenever needed, whenever they are having wheezing or shortness of breath, they can take a puff off uh, the inhaler. Usually for most asthmatics, the symptoms are controlled by just this occasional uh, inhaler which we call intermittent relief therapy so whenever they're having symptoms they will uh, take the puff of salbutamol uh, inhaler and their symptoms would be released. Uh, as we are covering broader subjects here uh, I also added some of the side effects of salbutamol that we need to know. Uh, major side effects are uh, it can cause anxiety, it can cause uh, tremor, it can decrease the level of potassium in your blood and it can also cause uh, tachyarrhythmia, speeding up your heart. So those are some of the things that the exam might ask you, uh, asking if a person is on uh, a salbutamol inhaler, what might be the side effects. If they do, these are the side effects that we can mention. This image is taken directly from the BDS guideline. So uh, this is the official guideline and step. This clearly depicts the ladder-like approach to the management as we talked about earlier. Here we notice that the first step in, uh, in regular prevention therapy is low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. If they don't seem to control the symptoms, the initial add-on therapy along with them is a long-acting beta-2 antagonist. Agonist. If the symptoms are still not controlled, we move on to the next step, uh, which is addition, in addition to increasing the dose of inhaled corticosteroids, we can add a third medication. Now, for the medications, we have uh, a choice. We could use a leukotriene receptor antagonist, we could use thiophilin, or we could use long-acting mescarinic antagonists. Um, well, once we have added the once we have the patient on three medications and the symptoms are still not controlled, the next step is the high-dose therapies, um, where, we, where they suggest that we increase the inhaled corticosteroid dose to an even higher dose and perhaps add a fourth medication. This could be one of the medications we just mentioned. Um, they also suggest that at this point, we refer the patient to a specialist. And finally, the last step uh, on the ladder is that if the patient is still, uh, patient symptoms are still not controlled with even four medication and high dose of inhaled corticosteroids, we should add a low dose of oral steroids to the regimen. Once again, the patient should be referred to a specialist at this time and point. As we talked about earlier, if a patient comes in and is he or she is using a short-acting beta-2 agonist to control the symptoms and inhaler, but it still has symptoms uh, and has to use the inhaler three or more times a week, or is waking up at night once a week due to wheezing, uh, we need to start the first step. And the first step, uh, which is suggested, is to start slow dose inhaled corticosteroids such as uh, beclomethasone. Usually we start with 200 micrograms uh, contained in one puff and the patient is supposed to take them twice a day. In step two, uh, the guidelines suggest adding a long acting beta 2 agonist such as salbut uh, salmeterol uh, two puffs twice a day. Uh, if this addition does not help, try increasing the dose of the inhaled corticosteroids along with it and see if that combination helps. If the patient reports no improvement at all, then uh, we are supposed to stop using the long-acting beta-2 uh, agonist. And um, over here, it is also interesting to know that compared to the BDS guidelines, the NICE guidelines suggest using a leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist as a first line rather than a long-acting beta-2 agonist. So now in the third step, we have tried inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta-2 uh, agonists together. The symptoms improve a little bit but still remain problematic for the patient. Then uh, here is the time that we try adding one of the three medications we talked about earlier. So it could be a leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist, thiophilin, or long-acting muscarinic antagonists to the regimen. Uh, so let's look at uh, these options individually and see how they, uh, what are the benefits of each one and how they work. So the leukotriene uh, receptor antagonists are the most commonly used ones. 
and uh, how they work are uh, is that uh, they work on the leukotriene receptors in the lungs and prevent bronchial constriction. Um, the most commonly used leukotriene receptor antagonists are Montelukast and uh, Zephyrilukast. Generally, we, uh, these medications are well tolerated, and can, but they can have some side effects, which are uh, such as mild a mild rash, fever, and they can also elevate your liver enzymes. Then uh, we also have pyrophilin. This works by inhibiting phosphodiesterase and increasing cyclic AMP levels uh, in your body and lungs in specific. Um, this in turn uh, leads to decreased bron bronchial constriction and relieving symptoms. So these are supposed to be taken orally at bedtime. Uh, a fact about thiophelin is that it is also used in acute asthma uh, attacks. So uh, in that case, it is given intravenously instead of being given orally. Uh, and as with any other medication, uh, the side effects are more heightened when it is given intravenously. The side effects are rather rare when uh, taken orally, but these side effects are uh, irregular heartbeats or arrhythmias, dizziness, fainting, GI symptoms, uh, chest pain, and the increased probability of having a seizure. Finally, the third group of uh, medications here are the long-acting mascarinic antagonists such as epitropium or tyrotropium. Uh, as these names suggest, they work on the muscles and reduce uh, mus muscle spasms. Um, technically, they're supposed to work, but they have really limited use in asthma, but would be really helpful in COPD. So even though the guidelines suggest that they could be used as a medication for chronic management of asthma, the literature suggests that they're not as effective as the other two options. So now we have the patient on three medications, a, a steroid inhaler, a long-acting beta-2 uh, agonist, and let's say a leukotriene receptor antagonist such as uh, Montelukast. But the patient's symptoms are still not under control. It is time for high-dose therapy. This means stepping up the inhaled corticosteroid levels to a higher dosage. This is usually uh, 2,000 micrograms a day. In addition to that, uh, you, can uh, you, cannot, uh, you can also consider adding a fourth medication if the patient was, let's say, on inhaled corticosteroids, long-acting beta-2 agonist, uh, montelukast, then we may add thiophelin to the list of medications. Considering at this point that uh, the patient is now on four different medications at higher dosages, it makes sense to refer them to a specialist who has more experience in managing such patients than we do. Uh, it is important to note over here that uh, for the PLAB-1 exam, the aim of uh, the GMC is to assess your functioning as an FY1 or an FY2 as a junior doctor. And a good practitioner always knows his or her limitations. Now we come to the last step, bringing out the big guns here. When the four medications don't work, then we add a low-dose oral steroid, usually uh, prednisolone is used. This is to be taken daily along with the high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and the other medications the patient was on already. Once again, here we emphasize, and the guidelines emphasize, that such patients should be best handled by a specialist and it is important to refer the patient to one if he or she has not been referred already. We come back to this diagram once again to review it and to hammer down the management once and for all. We start with a low-dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Step two, add a long-acting beta-2 agonist. If limited response from uh, the both of them, we move on to step three, that is adding, an, uh, adding either a uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist, thiophilin, or long-acting mascarinic antagonist. Step four, we increase the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid to a higher dose and add a fourth medication from one of the above. Um, next step, we also at this point refer to a specialist. Finally, uh, if 
there's inadequate control, uh, we start low-dose oral corticosteroids, um, such as prednisolone, uh, and continue high-dose inhaled corticosteroids while keeping other medications uh, going on as well. Once again, we refer the patient to a specialist for better management. Well, those were the guidelines, so thank you for making to the end of the video. Uh, I really hope that this helps you understand the management of chronic asthma in adults a little better. It definitely helped me. The guidelines really outline what we should do and uh, when what medication should be added. Um, I am still new to making these videos and I would really help to, uh, it really helped to get your feedback about what I'm doing right, what I should change and what topics to cover next. I would do my best to uh, give you correct information and uh, give it in a precise and interesting manner. But as I said, if you have any suggestions, please let me know if there are any corrections. If you see any mistakes, do let me know and uh, we can have a discussion um, in the comment section. So uh, thank you very much. Please do uh, spread the video around to your friends who are preparing for PLAB1 or just generally want to review material for exams.